ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय वेलकम टू टुडे रीडिंग फ्रॉम ब्रिलियंट एस द सन रीटेलिंग ऑफ शिवर भागवतम कैंटर फोर Krishna fulfills all desires we are going to begin chapter 14 king vena's great arrogance vena defies the authority of the sages and lord vishnu and is killed by the sages the leading sages of the world headed by prajapati bhrigu arrived at the king's palace to discuss who would succeed anga the chief ministers were reluctant to coronate king anga's son he is a wicked a moral son a moral man a moral man or is it a moral i want to pronounce it right a m o r a l which obviously means he is he is not a moral person the sages shook their heads this will not do one said the king must elevate his citizens in spiritual realization how is that possible if he is sinful himself just then the guards announced that certain prominent citizens were requesting permission to speak to the sages bring them in said prego two or three well dressed men entered the room and bowed pray speak your mind said prego o holy ones we seek protection In the few days since King Anga's disappearance, many people have been attacked and plundered. Some citizens have complained of being robbed in broad daylight. Did you go to the police? Yes, sir," said one of the citizens. They apprehended one or two men, but in the absence of king, there is no one to judge them. Hence, the police release them again. Another man said, "No one feels safe any more." please remain here and reestablish law and order when the men left the sages again spoke among themselves we certainly have the power to punish wrong doers said one but it does not befit renounced sages to administer a state that is why lord brahma created the warrior class yes said another without a king rogues will harass the people with impurity <clears throat> verse 2 brigu turned to the chief minister pray call queen sunita with her permission we will coronate her son vena all the ministers fell to their knees their hands clasped no not vena please find some other solution the sages collectively overrule their objection a blind king is better than no king kindly bring the queen with her permission we shall perform the coronation tomorrow verse 3 word of vena's installation quickly spread every criminal became terrified on hearing this news if we were caught and taken before them he will delight in cruelty sorry in cruelly torturing us they fled to the mountains where they hid in caves like rats fleeing from a snake so it's amazing that even the criminals they became terrified on hearing that uh, king vena is going to be coronated that they went into hiding in the caves in the mountains verse 4 after his coronation vena became extremely proud when the chief priest invited him to attend the shrine for vishnu's worship vena berated him who do you think you are to make such a request worship vishnu i shall have your tongue cut out for your insolence my lord said the priest shrinking back the king in your line have always attended vishnu's worship why should the king worship anyone fool do you not know that the king like kings like me have all eight mystic powers if i so wish i can become smaller than the smallest or greater than the greatest i can get anything i desire bring anyone under my control and create anything i wish even another kingdom what need do i have to worship vishnu turning to the guards he ordered throw this upstart into the dungeon 
When the priest was dragged away, Vena sat, scowling on his golden throne. How dare those arrogant Brahmins worship anyone but him? He called his chief minister, prepare the army and bring out my war chariot. Tomorrow I shall ride out on tour. Verses 5 to 6. The next day, Veda mounted his chariot like a maddened elephant. He traversed the kingdom, making the sky and earth tremble wherever he went. In every village and town, he had great drums beaten, summoning the citizens. When they assembled in the main square with the Brahmins at their head, he glared at them as his heralds proclaimed. Listen well. As of today, on the order of the great King Vena, one honorable lord and saviour, the priests of this land are forbidden to perform any sacrifice to Vishnu or the gods. No more offerings are to be wasted in sacrificial fires. No wealth or grains may be given in charity. Everything in this kingdom belongs to the king and must be used solely for him. He also ventured into the forests and mountains where, where the renowned sages dwelt and ordered them to stop their sacrifice on pain of death. As the chariot rumbled away, the sages gathered together. Did you hear how he threatened us with death? If we continue to worship Lord Vishnu, said one, I had heard of this so-called king's atrocities, but now I see it with my own eyes, another added. He must have threatened the Brahmins everywhere, said a third. This is very serious. Now, the eighth verse begins, said yet another. If sacrifice to Vishnu and the gods stops completely, the people face catastrophic shortages. Rain will not fall and famine will soon follow. We must remove him from power immediately. Another sage said, Do you not remember how much the people were disturbed by thieves? Without a king, criminals will again persecute the poor citizens. It was for this very reason that ignoring the ministers, please we, instated Vena. The sages sat with downcast expressions. One of them sighed. The poor citizens are like ants trapped on a long log ablaze at both ends. I'll repeat. The sages sat down with downcast expressions. One of them sighed. The poor citizens are like ants Trapped on a log, a blaze at both without a king, they will suffer. Fight, we installed Vena <clears throat> because of a political crisis. But now we face an even bigger problem from the king himself. As long as he remains in power, the people will never be happy. The other sages murmured with agreement. Verse 10, one of them said, we should have foreseen this. His mother Sunita is a death's daughter. So Sunita was the daughter of death. A male child generally inherits his mother's nature. For this reason, Vena is by nature troublesome. He is supposed to protect the people, but instead he has become their worst enemy. Supporting him is like feeding a snake with milk. He will only get worse. The other sages called out in agreement. Some suggested they immediately leave this kingdom. Verses 11 and 12. One of the senior sages stood up to speak. My dear friends, he said, we appointed Vena as king so that he might protect the citizens, but now he has become their greatest threat. Still, we should first try to pacify him with gentle words. If we do not endeavor to rectify him, then we ourselves will be tainted by his sinful reactions. We install him despite knowing his evil nature. Let us now advise him for his good. If he refuses to listen to us, then we will join those who oppose him. By our spiritual power, we will burn him to ashes. The sages applauded loudly. Verse 13. The next day, a contingent of sages arrived at King Vena's palace and were ushered into his audience hall. Concealing their anger, they spoke sweetly, All glories to King Vena. May you live long and prosper. Vena looked down haughtily from his raised throne. What use is your blessings for me? Who, who am I, the supreme ruler of the world? Have you come seeking some boon from me? 
maybe your wish death at my hands at my hands so you may attain liberation maybe you wish death at my hands so you may attain liberation he threw back his head and laughed the sages mustered their patience and remained calm verse 14 the leader said dear king we wish you well please hear us carefully and by so doing your life's duration strength opulence and fame will all increase Vena leaned forward. Oh, do you have some magical elixir? Or perhaps you know of some hidden treasure? Verses 14 and to 17 now, the sages glanced at one another. Was there any limit to Vena's foolishness? The leader said, O oh, king, those who live according to religious principles and who follow them by words, mind, body and intelligence, live free of misery in this world and ultimately achieve liberation. O oh, great hero, for this reason you should not obstruct the spiritual life of your citizens. If on your order they give up their spiritual practices, you will certainly fall down from your opulent royal position. A king can legitimately tax his citizens if in return he protects them from disturbance by evil ministers and criminals a pious monarch can thus enjoy himself in this world and the next. Vena's mouth fell upon. Were these skinny old men telling him what to do? Verses 18 and 19 now, the chief sage observed Vena's incredulity. Perhaps he did not understand the benefit of properly discharging his duties. The sage said a pious king should direct his citizens to worship Lord Vishnu by strictly observing their Varnashram duties. O Noble One, the Supreme Lord, the Supreme Soul, sorry, the Super Soul and origin of this universe is pleased when the King ensures everyone worships him. Worship, verses 20 to 22 now. Even the gods who rule the higher planets along with the citizens take pleasure in worshipping Vishnu, knowing that when he is satisfied, Anything can be achieved. My dear King, the Supreme Lord, along with the principal gods, enjoys the results of all sacrifice conducted throughout the universe. He is the three Vedas, the proprietor of everything and the goal of all penance. Therefore, for your own prosperity, you, shall ensure, you should ensure your people perform sacrifice to please Vishnu. When the Brahmins are so engaged, the gods who are empowered by Vishnu are satisfied and they grant whatever you desire. However, if you stop sacrifice, you will displease the gods. Verses 23 to 27 now, Veda's face darkened, his mouth twisting into a sneer. You are all fools, you confuse irreligion for religion. You are like unchaste women who abandon their husbands who maintain them to search for lovers. The king is the supreme lord who, those who out of ignorance fail to worship him, will not experience happiness either in this life or the next. Who are these gods you so much adore? Indeed, your fondness for them is exactly like the affection of an unchaste woman who neglects her married life and gives all her attention to her paramour. Do you not know that all the gods from whom you seek benedictions reside in the king's body. All of them, even Vishnu, Brahma, Shiva, Indra, Vayu, Yama, Surya, Bhumi, Agni, Varuna and all others are merely parts and parcels of the king. The sages looked at one another. Did not, did Veda not understand anything? Excuse me. The ruler as Vishnu's authorized representative should encourage his worship, not unserve it. Verse 28, Vena, his head held high, pointed at the sages, give up your envy for me, of me, worship me by your rituals, offer me everything. If you were actually intelligent, you would know that no one is superior to me and that I alone am worthy of accepting the first oblations of all sacrifice. Verse 29, the Brahmins quietly conferred, this king has lost all intelligence due to his sinful life and deviation from the right path. 
He is truly bereft of all good fortune. Even though we spoke to him with great respect, still he has remained deaf to our pleas. Indeed, he is condemned. Verse 30. Vena stood up and shouted, Repent your sins, you, you fools, lest I have you all killed. The sages sighed. They had hoped for a better outcome. Verse 31. The eldest sage said to the others, We must kill him. He is the most dreadful, sinful person. If he lives, he will certainly turn the whole world into ashes in no time. Verse 32. Another sage added, The impious, impudent man does not know does not in the least deserve to sit on the throne. He is so shameless that he even dares insult Lord Vishnu. Verse 33. Still another expressed his disbelief. I cannot imagine anyone being as sinful as Vena. How dare, how does he dare blaspheme Vishnu by whose mercy he enjoys great wealth and power? Verse 34. As they spoke, their anger mounted. We must kill him immediately. Yes, there is no sin in killing sinful Vena, for due to his blasphemies against Vishnu, he is as good as dead. In a body they faced Vena and angrily uttered, Hmm. As the powerful sound reverberated, Vena clutched his chest, his face a mask of agony. He collapsed to the floor, gasping and gave up his life. Verse 35, the garden ministers ran to his limp body. A great shout of the king is dead vibrated throughout the hall. Maid servants ran to tell the queen mother amidst the havoc of sages quietly left and returned to their respective hermitages. Sunita ran in, her hair disheveled, wailing loudly, Vena, my son. She fell down and embraced his lifeless body. The ministers gently persuaded her to let go. As her maidservants led her away, she turned to the court brahmins. Do not cremate him. We must preserve his body. I know this can be done with herbs and mantras. The brahmins reassured grieving Vena that they, could, they would comply with her wish. Verses 36 and 37. Sometimes later, the same sages who had killed Vena, after completing their daily duties of offering oblations into the sacrifice, sacrificial fire, were seated by the river Saraswati discussing Krishna's transcendental pastimes. As they spoke, several merchants burst through the woods with their families. Seeing the sages, they hurried in their direction. The sages welcomed them, offering them roots and berries. The travelers thankfully accepted their hospitality. As they ate, they kept glancing behind to see if anyone was coming. Who are you running from? The sages asked. You know, when we read the sages offered roots and berries to the travelers, that means uh, root says all the root vegetables. And berries, as you know, all the various kinds of berries. The th travelers thankfully accepted their hospitality as they ate. They kept glancing behind to see if anyone was coming. Who are you running from? The sages asked. The men explained that after King Vena's death, criminal bands had become increasingly bold. They break into people's homes, kidnap women, kill men and steal land and belongings. The men said they were among many refugees who were fleeing these marauders. Often they pursued survivors for the few possessions they had managed to take with them. Verse 38, just then a great dust storm swept over the area. The merchants panicked. This must be them. They, they chase their victims relentlessly. Surely they will be killing us if they find us. Run for your lives. The terrified citizens ran toward nearby caves. Verses 39 to 40. 
The sages looked at each other in alarm. One king said, one said, King Rena's death has left the kingdom without a protector. Now there is not even a semblance of law and order. Indeed, it seems there is an uprising in murderous plunderers. A young sage said, we killed Rena, now we must kill these rogues. Several others shook their heads. One said, we could, but there, where will it stop? It is improper for sages to do the king's work. They all agreed. They should not directly intervene. Verse 41, a senior sage said, still we must do something. Although as Brahmins we should be peaceful and impartial, we should not neglect others' suffering. By doing so, our spiritual powers will diminish, just as water kept in a cracked pot leaks out. Verses 42 to 44 now. Finally, the sages decided their best course of action was to revive King Anga's dynasty. After all, with the exception of Vena, the kings in this line had been both powerful devotees of Vishnu. They returned to the capital and after consulting with Sunita, employed a mystical method of producing a child from Vena's corpse. Taking hold of his legs as they churned his thighs with great force while intoning sacred mantras, after some time a dwarf was born from Vena's corpse. He had blackish complexion like a crow, his limbs were short and his jaw large. He had a flat nose, reddish eyes and copper coloured hair. Verse 45, as soon as he was born, he bowed meekly to the sages, sirs, what shall I do? The sages said in one voice, Nishid Bahuka. Nishid Bahuka. Or is it Nishid Bahuk? A gentle breeze rustled the leaves of the tree under, the Vidu, under which Vidura sat with Maitreya. Vena was great fool, said Vidur, but tell me, who was the dwarf that came from his body? What did the sages mean by Nishid Bahuk? Maitreya explained that Bahuk means dwarf. So Bahuk means dwarf. There is a race of dwarfs known as the Nishads, I believe, said Vidur. Verse 46, which is the last verse of this chapter. Yes, said Maitreya. Bahuk was the father of the Nishad race who were infamous for their sinful activities like stealing, plundering and hunting. Therefore, they are banished to live in the hills and forest. forests. They acquired their sinful nature because Bahuk assumed Venus sinful nature they're, therefore, they are banished to live in the hills and forests. They acquired the sinful nature because Bahuk assumed Vena's sinful inclinations. So, this brings us to the end of this chapter. <clears throat> Arrogance of King Vena. And uh, King Vena's Great Arrogance, actually this is the title of chapter 14, we just finished of Canto 4, King Vena's Great Arrogance, he was a descendant of Dhruva and shame to see that how very impious son was born, he was very impious, Vena was very impious because he was a son of the daughter of death, Sunita. So he had those qualities and how the sages, they after all the consultations manifested the Bahuk, Nishad Bahuk, Nishid Bahuk from the body of, from the corpse of King Vena, who his mother Sunita had asked to preserve it, and uh, it's a it's a shame that uh, 
this had happened in the dynasty but it's all uh, according to the according to what is uh, in the shastras so it's all god's arrangements and now this dwarf has been born from that corpse and we will read further from chapter 4 next time from chapter 15 king prithu appears thank you for joining wish you all blissful day ahead hariyam tatsat hari krishna